Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. One of the questions we're getting from really around the country this year has been late planted acres. What considerations are there if you're getting your crop planted a little bit later than normal? Another thing as we enter into June that quite often happens is we'll start to see some lodging issues show up, especially as we go throughout the summer. And the question always comes back to, well, why did this happen? I know we had strong winds, but what else can I do to prevent lodging on my farm? We'll talk about that today. Well, we've got a weed of the week that may not be as big of an issue in the fields as it is around your home. We'll explain that coming up later in the show, but first, here's today's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. Hail is one of the worst things that can happen to a farmer. Today we're going to talk a little about what farmers do in the event of hail. Well, when you see those storms coming in, many times, like right now this year on our farm, we're hoping to catch some rain out of it, but not any of the solid frozen rain called hail. Hail can definitely be a big issue as we go through the season. Now, early on this year, we had some corn that we lost, basically to a freeze, not from hail, but it was short enough. It was only two leaves out of the ground, and it's only a couple inches tall, that the growing point was still below the ground. If hail comes that early in the season, we aren't as concerned because, well, so what if we lost a couple of leaves? It's no big deal. Yeah, but here's what this all comes back to. Where is the growing point on the plant? With grass plants, typically the growing point is still going to be below the ground and protected by the soil and other leaves and basically all the future leaves that are going to come out. So until that corn plant reaches about six to eight inches tall, the growing point will be below ground and pretty well protected. In other words, if the corn plant is not six to eight inches tall and it gets hailed off completely down to the ground, the plant's probably still gonna live, no problem. The difference here is when we talk about broadleaf crops, like soybeans, for example, all the growing points are above ground as soon as that plant emerges from the soil. So if that plant gets clipped down to the ground and nothing is left, well, that plant is completely dead. So it gets to be a lot of question. Once you have some hail, just assessing how many of these plants are gonna be alive, how many of them are going to die? Are there areas of the field that we would need to replant? Is it sporadic enough through the field that we've got a good enough stand we can keep it? Yep, so that's the first question. The second question is, all right, let's say the crop is bigger and we just have some hail damage. How much did that really cost me as a farmer? And that's usually when you call the insurance company and the adjuster comes out and then he'll rate your loss and he'll say, well, it looks like you only had a 6% loss here. And you say, what? It's gotta be more than that because my crop looks terrible. I have to have had more loss than 6%, but here's what the insurance adjusters are looking at. And this is one of the things Darren and I learned years ago. We went to an Iowa State University seminar down in Ames. We were young agronomists just trying to learn some things. And we got to Iowa State's farm, their research farm, and we saw this machine. And I said, hey, what's, what's that? And they said, well, that's our hail machine. What? A hail machine? Yes, it's basically like an ice maker and they would shred this ice and shoot it at the crops simulating hail. And because of that, and because of the work that other universities have done, we now have a real good idea at all different stages of crop how much actual loss there will be. So the big thing at this point is figuring out what stage of growth your crop was at. Then take a look at one of these online calculators, whether it's Iowa State's, if you want to search for that on the internet. I know Nebraska has a good one and I'm sure maybe there's a state closer to where you're at that has a good estimate of how much yield you could have potentially lost due to some hail damage at various growth stages. So you kind of figure that out. Let's just say, for example, that you've lost 50% of your yield potential. Normally you'd be 200 bushel corn. Now you're only going to get 100 bushel corn. Then the next thing would be, all right, if I replanted today, what kind of yield potential would I have? Certainly it's much less yield potential than if you would have planted during the ideal planting window. Maybe you say, well, I'm only giving up 10% yield by planting this late. All right, if you've got the chance of a 90% yield versus a 50% yield, you may want to replant. But if you say, goodness, I'm giving up 50% of my yield potential because I'm planting so late in the year and I'm gonna have to plant earlier maturities and it's gonna cost me all this money to do the replant, it may not be worth replanting either. So this is what farmers are looking at. And again, 
again, they'll use these hail charts. This is what the insurance companies use. But any farmer that has hail, he wants to assess what the damage is, look at how much that's going to cost him, look at what he can potentially gain by replanting today, and what insurance is going to pay, because insurance will typically offer something different. If they say, well, look, we're gonna zero out your crop. We're gonna give you 50% right now. We're gonna give you cash today, whatever it is, or we're gonna just take it to harvest, see how it turns out, versus, hey, we're gonna wipe this thing out, give you X number of dollars, and then you get to replant. So those are the decisions that the farmer's gotta weigh out all the time. And we don't necessarily know what the rest of the season's gonna bring, but the great thing is with crop insurance today, at least the farmer does have some protection for hail in most cases. Well, you know, Brent, I wish I had that hail machine and we could go right in between the rows and wipe out our weed of the week. Can you identify this tough weed? What's next in weed control technology? Roundup Ready 2 Extend Soybeans will provide tolerance to dicamba and glyphosate and will be built on the Genuity Roundup Ready to Yield trade. See them in action at extendfollowafield.com. The Case I-8 Spring Sales Event is on now, making it a great time to get the equipment you need for this season. With 0% financing for 60 months on all Farmall and Maxim Series tractors, as well as our complete line of hay tools, you can turn everyday chores into everyday savings. But hurry, the Spring Sales Event ends June 30th, 2014. For more information, ask your local Case IH dealer or go to caseih.com slash special offers. A farmer's attention to detail is what makes the difference. You take the time for service management because you know how vital it is to your operation. You service your field like everything else because soil sampling makes all the difference and gets the results you want. Download the app Soil Test Pro and start grid sampling today. Keep your farm growing strong. The more you test, the more you know. If you could see how nitrogen loss causes yield loss, you'd fix it. So fix it right, with the stabilizer proven to reduce all three ways nitrogen escapes. Nutrisphere N Nitrogen Fertilizer Manager. It keeps nitrogen in a more readily available form longer. With today's market and environment, it's a high priority to keep your nitrogen on track. To higher yield with Nutrisphere N. Looking to maximize yield? Quickroots is a microbial seed inoculant that allows the plant root to explore a greater volume of soil, the key to higher yields. Quickroots continues to generate yield response on corn, soybeans, wheat, and more. Quickroots is applied to the seeds so the live microorganisms go right to work, enhancing seedling vigor, increasing the uptake of certain nutrients, including NPK, and expanding root volume. Maximize yield on your farm this season. Call TJ Technologies or your local dealer and get your quick roots today. A proven herbicide for decades, dicamba can provide burn down residual control of tough and resistant weeds for up to 14 days. That's another reason why farmers will use dicamba for years to come. Brought to you by Roundup Ready Plus Weed Management Solutions. When it comes to late planting decisions on the farm, that's one of the toughest things. We've run into it ourselves too. Before we'd put a lot of tile on our farm, we had many years where we were planting in late June, even some in early July, and you have to weigh out, hey, crop insurance says this is my last plant date, then my insurance goes down for all these remaining days, and boy, I was to the end, and literally we in some cases continued on, planted the crop, even though we had no insurance coverage, just because we wanted to get something in the ground. And that's, I guess we wanted to talk about a little bit today, is some of these considerations, some of the things you need to think about when you're planting late on your farm. Well, it's different for every farm. Everybody's got different considerations. Maybe you have livestock and you say, you know what, I'm gonna plant corn late because I'm gonna chop it for silage. Or maybe you say, you know, I have so many acres, I'm gonna plant certain fields late because I know I still have potential, but other fields, I'm just not gonna do it because there's no way I can get all the work done. For us, we're fighters. We like to get stuff planted. We're thinking about, you know, where we have a crop planted in the field, things generally turn out better the next year for us too because we've kept all that biological activity going in our soil by having that crop out there for the bacteria and microbes to work around. Others will say, well, I'm just gonna plant a cover crop, so I'm not worried about that aspect. I just wanna make the most money I can this year. I mean, it's all up to you how you wanna look at things. For me, I, I'm looking at it from the angle of, you know, there's still a chance. 
Uh, we're still in June. We've got plenty of time here. We're still gonna have enough of a growing season to raise a crop. So let's look at the factors that will help us be successful putting a crop in. All right, but let's talk about this, Darren, because this is one of the things you and I disagree on just a little bit. I switch to earlier varieties. When we start getting late, we've gone through it so many times yeah, on our farm. Yeah, but you switch too soon. That's, well, that's the thing. There's always there. that debate of, yep. do I switch varieties now or do I still have another week or so that I can plant that variety that I really like that I know works well in my yep, garden? Yep, but here's the thing. After you've gone through just a few times in your life where you've had an early frost and you end up combining 40% corn and you have to scoop it out of a grain wagon, gravity box, whatever, that's not a lot of fun. And you have to dry it. We one year had a dryer start on fire because we were trying to dry 40% stuff down. So it's just a few of those things. It's kind of like our dad always used to tell us, you know, our grandpa was super conservative. I mean, just ridiculously conservative. But he said, you know what? You can't judge him because he went through the depression era. Okay, so once you've had that experience, it's hard to ever go back and change that experience and wipe that out. So all he thought about the rest of his life was depression era. It's the same thing for me on our farm. I remember scooping that out. I remember the fire that started in our dryer. I don't ever want that again. So I'm probably more to the conservative now, now side and I that go to that the dryer, early stuff. That dryer is relatively close to Brian's house. That may be part of that concern hey, and I, too. Also, I wasn't the guy watching the dryer <laughs> that night, so that was the good news for me. But still, I mean, it's just one of these things where, you know, everybody's going to have a little different opinion. Yes, I switch to earlier stuff. So whether it's corn, it's soybeans, whatever, I want to go to earlier day crop sooner than Darren would. Well, okay, here's the other side of it. It's not just the date that you make that change and you say, all right, June 10th, Tenth is my cutoff. I'll plant a full season soybean up to June 10th and then I'll switch to something earlier. Our disagreement is a little bit deeper than that because when Brian switches to early, he goes way earlier. And I think there's a gap there. Now, in different parts of the country, this discussion could change because if you're talking about indeterminate soybeans versus determinate soybeans, that's a little different discussion. But where we're talking about really short season soybeans to begin with, our full season crop here is an early group two. For me, I don't ever want to switch more than one full maturity group away from what my ideal is. So if I'm planting May 15th, and I say, okay, I'm still in the optimum planting window, I'm gonna plant a 2.3 maturity as full season for our farm, great. If I get a month later, I'm gonna drop down to a 1.3 on the earliest side. Now, here's where yeah, we but find a month, a, a, Yeah, but a month later, I don't have any issue with that. I'm in total agreement, 1.3, but the problem is two months later. So when we've planted in early July, I'm going double zero. Even in late June, I'm going zero. In mid-June, yeah, I'm probably going early group one, and that first of June to the fifth of June, I'm still pretty comfortable planting a late group one to an early group two. So that's kind of how we move things on our farm. I agree, if you're just a month later, probably one maturity group is fine, but when you're a month and a half to almost two months later, I think you gotta go down two maturity groups. All right, now when we're talking about corn here, it's a little bit different discussion too. We need to accumulate heat units with the corn. With our early maturing soybeans, they're going to mature based on the day length shortening. So we start planting in July, I mean, those beans barely get up and they're already starting to flower and go into the reproductive stages. With our corn, we've got a lot of heat units we have to accumulate before we can get to those reproductive stages. And like Brandon was talking about, 40% moisture corn. Yeah, if we plant a full season corn in mid-June, we're going to be in trouble because we're going to get our first frost normally yeah. in late September, early October, and we're going to be in trouble. So what we've typically done is gone to shorter season crops, soybeans in particular. So we abandon corn once we get into, you know, around the 1st of June. That's pretty much much for us in our area in Southeast South Dakota. That's when we abandon corn and we just say, look, we're planting all soybeans from this point out. And that's not a bad deal this year because the soybeans are actually dollaring out fairly yeah. well, potentially. But, anyway. but to your point, when you're going to plant super late and you're planting a really early variety, it's only going to get up a little bit in our area of the country. Then it's going to start flowering and potting and everything else. That's typically when drilling is going to pay a little bit more than having a wider row spacing. All right. So I think, yeah, that row spacing is something where we want to capture all the sunlight we can. Right. So a narrower row when we're planting later is a good thing. The other thing is fertility. You can't skimp on that. And I know that some guys will say, well, I'm putting it in late, so I just don't have that much potential. Okay, that may be true. Maybe you don't have 
uh, 200 bushel corn potential, but on your soybeans, planting them in early June, you really haven't given up much at all in yield potential. You need to be putting a full dose of fertilizer out there. You have to be realistic with your well, yield goals, but don't say, well, I'm only gonna put half the fertilizer out there. Then you will only get half the crop. It's not just the fertility, it's everything all season long. Cause a lot of times guys will plant stuff a little late. They plant their beans mid June and then they say, well, you know, I just scabbed the crop in. So I'm not that worried about weed control or bug control or disease control. And then yeah, they really do have a disaster and they end up with 25 bushel beans. You still have to continue to look at return on investment with each individual thing you do. When Roundup costs three, four dollars an acre, I mean, you only have to kill a few weeds and you were able to pay for that. When a full dose of insecticide for soybean aphids is two dollars an acre, you don't have to have many bugs out there, even with late planted beans to make that pay. Same thing with disease. I mean, if you end up with a wet summer, I mean, why do you think you're planting late? It's because it's wet. You probably have root infection right away and you probably have leaf diseases happening later in the season as well. So fungicide most likely is going to pay even though your yield potential now is only 40 as opposed to 60 if you plant it early. And you're right. If you do have fields that are too wet and that's what's causing you to be late, you need to look at improving your drainage in that field. Yep. And I know a lot of guys will say, well, I'll just have to wait till fall to address that. I know we've already been talking about this a little bit this spring on Ag PhD. You've got to get out there in season and do some drainage tile because let's face it, on those spots in your field that really need the drainage, you're not going to hurt your yield at all running over just a little bit of crop trying to put in some tile lines. We have never seen that show up on our yield monitors that we've hurt yield doing that. So once again, if you're ending up in a situation where you have to plant the crop late, I guess the number one thing I want to stress to you is don't get all emotional about it. Just make it a business decision. Once emotion enters in, then you start making bad decisions. So just take your time, step back, take a deep breath. It's not the end of the world. In most cases, you still have some potential to make some money on your farm. Just take your time and do the right thing for your operation. Check with some other farmers, check with some other agronomists, see what's worked in your area. And then like we say, you usually late in the season. With soybeans, you want to move down in maturity a little bit. You also want to plant narrower rows and treat your beans pretty well. You still have pretty good potential even planting a month past your normal optimum date. One thing that's good about late planting is a lot of times those cool season weeds, you've got to wipe them out with some tillage or with a burn down, but those late emerging weeds like our weed of the week could still be popping up. We'll show you how to control this tough weed coming up later in the show. I wish I could side dress more than just nitrogen. You can. While side dressing is efficient for nitrogen applications, you can also use that opportunity to apply PK and the micronutrients your crop needs. AgroLiquids Calibrate and MicroLink products allow you to nutritionally balance your side dress application efficiently and economically. Let agriculture liquid fertilizer help you make your next crop a bumper crop. For more info, visit agroliquid.com. You can put more bushels in your bin without expanding the farm with Yield Trap. The new 24 row planter from Titan Machinery features the Case IH Early Riser Planting System. Yield Track will take you to the field first with extra flotation come spring. The tracks eliminate pinched rows and reduce compaction. All 22 and 30 inch Yield Tracks come loaded with Case IH technology, including cable drive and AccuRow. Grab more bushels from every acre with Yield Track from Titan Machinery. Wake up, breakfast is served. Your roots crave pee. Most of your applied pee gets tied up in the soil, a natural phenomenon known as phosphorus fixation. Fix the problem with Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. Avail makes more pee available to your roots. Here, here, and here. Increasing pee availability can lead to increased pee uptake in the plant. That's more pee, more pee, and more pee. More phosphorus for your crop can be more results in your bin. An average of 9.6 bushels per acre of corn. Breakfast is served. Supercharge your pee with Avail. Get the most from the genetic potential in your crops, reduce plant stress, and increase yield. BioForge upregulates key genes to keep roots growing and reduce ethylene for improved plant stress tolerance. BioForge mixes well with other products for easy application with every pass through the field. BioForge, progressive grower's choice to improve root growth, reduce crop stress, and increase yield. Make every growing day count with BioForge from Stoller USA. 
If you watch Ag PhD TV, you'll love the new Ag PhD radio show each weekday on Rural Radio Sirius XM Channel 80. This is Darren Hefty. On the new Ag PhD radio program, we'll take live callers and provide the agronomic information and brotherly banter you've come to expect from Ag PhD. We'll feature a Back 40 segment where we talk to farmers and agronomists around the country to share what's going on with crop production. And it wouldn't be Ag PhD without addressing a pest of the day. Tune in to the Ag PhD radio show each weekday at 2 p.m. Central on Rural Radio Sirius XM Channel 80. Well, here's one of my favorite topics, lodging in crops, oh, and I'll tell you why. That's not my favorite. But I'll tell you why, because when I talk to farmers all over the country, when they have a lodging issue, they'll talk to me and say, hey, I had a lodging issue, and who do you think they blame? They blame the seed. So in other words, let's say it's corn especially, but even in soybeans or wheat, it all goes back to the seed dealer. And here's usually the case. I'm not saying in all cases, but usually the case. It's not the seed dealer's fault. It's generally speaking a potassium issue. Other than that, it might be compaction or an insect, but it's very rarely the fault of the seed. So the first thing that I like to do is dig up that root mass and see what's going on. Look for insect feeding. Look at the depth of that root mass. Perhaps you've got a drainage issue in your field where your roots were only able to get down a few inches. We were talking about late planted acres earlier in the show and when we think about late planted acres it's a lot of times because it's too wet. Well if it's too wet the root system can't get deep enough to provide a good anchor for the plant. So that could be an issue or compaction as Brian mentioned could be limiting our root growth. If we see that the root growth is fine the next thing I really want to look at is what the nutrient load has been in that Well, field. that's the first thing that I want to look at. I want to see the guy's soil tests and his plant tissue analysis. So if you have good soil tests from out in that field where you got base saturation tests done and you had plant tissue samples every week during the growing season, I can tell you just right off the bat if you're okay on nutrients or not. And generally speaking, almost every lodging field I've ever been in in my life, there just isn't enough potassium. That's what it all comes back to. You've got to have ample K. Look at your base saturation test unless you're test is in the range of four to eight percent K, you don't have enough. A lot of tests I see it's one and a half, maybe two percent for K at the most. That's not even close. So of course you're going to have lodging issues. That's exactly what that means. So here's what we're going to come back to. Don't even think about increasing your population. In fact, decrease your population if you've had lodging issues until you get ample potassium out there. So test your soils, do some plant tissue analysis, really take a hard look at this thing. It could be compaction, it could be bugs. There's a tiny, tiny chance it's the actual seed you're planting, but in almost all cases, it's lack of potassium. Fix that and your lodging issues will go away. For more information on the fertility needs for your crop, just get the Ag PhD fertilizer removal app. Well, one other thing that you'll need to control in your fields in addition to fertility is weeds. We'll show you how to stop this weed coming up next. The Weed of the Week is sponsored by the Enlist Weed Control System from Dow AgroSciences, a new herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate. You work to protect your farm's legacy and to keep it going. Introducing the Enlist Weed Control System, an advanced herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate for exceptional control of tough weeds. The next chapter begins. Our Weed of the Week is crabgrass. It's a warm season grass, so typically we don't see crabgrass very early in the season, and normally we don't see it out in our row crop fields. We more commonly see it in our grassy areas, especially as the summer starts to warm up and dry out. Hey, the good news though is it's just an annual. That is a nice thing if we're talking about perennial grasses in our lawn and we see some crabgrass pop up. We can take a couple of good shots at crabgrass. We can do something early pre-emerge. The active ingredient that gets used very often is pendimethalin, which is the same active ingredient that's found in prowl that we can use in soybeans and other crops. So products for the lawn would be something like dimension. You can also use drive either early or a little later in the season. That's typically what we'll do around 
our houses is use this drive product. Generally speaking, about the time the lilacs bloom is what they always say in our area. It takes about the same amount of heat units to get the crabgrass to grow. Yep, so anyway, you want to hit it that way. And then the big thing is just don't let it go to seed. As long as it doesn't go to seed, then crabgrass shouldn't be a problem going forward. Okay, so that's how you control crabgrass in lawns. How about in crops? Well, soybeans, pretty easy. Trefland, Sonalan, or Prowl down, select or round up something like that post. In corn, Roundup's the best way to go if you have Roundup ready corn. The pre's aren't real good on it. They have some activity, dual harness, outlook surpass. They're just not outstanding, so that's why you need a good post. Accents okay on it if you get it real small in conventional corn. In wheat, start with something like prepare early on and then the grass killers are okay later on it's just we don't really worry about it that much because wheat's an early season cool grass so you're going to choke out the late season warm grass crabgrass that's all time we have for this week's weed but iron talk is coming up next iron talk is brought to you by case ih what are farmers doing to feed the planet they're using Quadtrek technology, soil management, and planting systems from Case IH to foster a better growing environment that maximizes yield potential. Visit CaseIH.com to be ready. When you're considering what time of day is best to spray, you're probably thinking of times when the wind isn't blowing hard. In today's Iron Talk, we'll discuss how calm conditions could be even worse than spraying with a light breeze. The reason calmer conditions could potentially be bad has to do with air inversions. This is a condition that often happens in calm to very light wind weather conditions, often early in the mornings or in the evenings. There's a layer of warm air trapped between cool air near the ground and another cool layer above. In an inversion, spray particles will move horizontally since they can't move vertically through these layers. This can result in spray drift moving further than you would ever imagine. To sum things up, yes, you need to look for conditions where it's not too windy to spray. Often, this is in the early morning or after supper. However, you still need some common sense to avoid spraying when there are air inversions and moisture conditions that could negatively impact your spray's performance or lead to drift. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now, back to the show. Can I grow my crop without the expense of fertilizer additives? You can. Conditions forcing you to make some tough choices? Choose agricultural liquid fertilizers and you won't need stabilizers or nutrient managers, eliminating expense and hassle. Millions of acres and years of replicated research have proven that with ProGerminator, SureK, High Energy and, and MicroLink, you can grow a great crop without costly additives. To learn more and find a dealer near you, visit agroliquid.com. Capella corn headers are designed for producers who expect more. Expect more grain in your bin. Expect an industry-leading two-year manufacturer's warranty. Expect Capella design chopping and folding options that save you time and money. And whether red, green, or yellow, expect row size options that fit your operation because all producers deserve the best. Expect Capello. It's a head above the rest. The math for getting higher yield potentials is simple. Four is greater than two. Steiger Rotrack Series tractors give you proven Case IH Quattrek technology, helping you cover more acres in less time. And with four independent oscillating tracks, you'll also minimize ground pressure and compaction for a better growing environment, all of which adds up to higher potential yields. The world of farming is changing. Be ready with Case IH. Farmer's attention to detail is what makes the difference. You take the time for service management because you know how vital it is to your operation. You service your field like everything else because soil sampling makes all the difference and gets the results you want. Download the app Soil Test Pro and start grid sampling today. Keep your farm growing strong. The more you test, the more you know. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. The all-new s -Cube commercial tender is the only tender on the market with poly tanks, giving you the capability to haul seed, fertilizer, water, or liquid fertilizer. Each cube can hold 300 units of seed, 2,000 gallons of liquid, or 300 cubic feet of fertilizer. Options include full-functioning wireless remote, stainless steel conveyors, and self-contained hydraulics. Get yours today at Norwood Sales. 
That's all the time we have for today's show, but for more agronomic information, be sure to tune in to Ag PhD Radio each weekday at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern on Rural Radio. That's Sirius XM Channel 80. Don't forget to tune in to Ag PhD TV next week for another Weed of the Week Farm Basics Iron Talk and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. American ethanol is made primarily from corn. Did you realize that the type of corn used for ethanol and livestock feed is much different than the sweet corn on your dinner table? For more information, visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org.